And welcome to the Missions Podcast, the show that explores your hard questions on missions, theology, and practice to help goers think and thinkers go. And we're here in 2023 recording again. Here I am from the ABWE International Headquarters with Scott Dunford, pastor of Redeemer Church in Fremont, California, joining through the power of the web. Scott, our listeners may not know this because we've we've taken a little bit of a break. We've had plenty of new content coming out, but it's been several weeks since we've both sat down here behind the mics. And uh, first of all, a lot has happened in your life. Your daughter's expecting. We were just talking about that. We're also celebrating Nathaniel Tito Estevez, our producer of the show, the guy behind the ones and twos right now making this magic happen. He's also a father. So, you know, Scott, love is in the air. It's just a wonderful time to be alive. Yeah, I wish we were one of those shows that you could push a button and had all the fun sounds. Like maybe Tito can do that post production, but like I, I like I like listening to that. Yes, yeah, so let's get an applause track going right now. Congratulations, Tito. And congratulations to me. I feel like grandfatherness looks really good on me. And I feel I feel smarter already. Uh, I feel like I want to save more money to buy. I've, I've already bought kids toys. I bought, I bought the whole collection of the office little people <laughs> for, my, for, for my my future granddaughter to be playing with. So I'm I'm set, man. I am I set. have those same little people in my office. I got those Do as you. a gift years ago. Yes. So I'm there oh. with you, man. I resonate with that. You and my uh, baby granddaughter will be playing with the same toys, Alex. That sounds completely appropriate and normal, socially, (laughs) every other way. Uh, Before we jump completely off the rails, we have an important guest this week. He's returning to the show. He's doing some awesome things in the world of missions. But first, in this new year, 2022 or 2023, whenever it is. Uh, We want to thank you for listening to the show. If it's your first time, or if you've been listening loyally for years, I want to give a shout out. We just received a a donation into the account, a a small gift, but you know, every little gift goes a long way. We've got some new things that we're trying to do this year, including, by the way, you didn't hear this from me, but there, there is an idea for another podcast coming from ABWE. So not making any promises. I don't know, but I'm just saying there's there's ideas, there's talk, you know, things are, things are going well. You got to give the people what they want. They want more of this content, apparently. Anyway, some awesome things are happening and it's because of the generosity of our listeners and our supporters and those that believe in the mission. And you can be one of those partners at missionspodcast.com slash support. And of course, one of the best ways that you can help us is just by helping the show get in front of more people that can be blessed, that can be mobilized. So share the show with a friend, leave a positive rating and review. Enough of that for now. Scott, who are we talking to this week? Well, a friend that I got to know a few years ago, although I had heard of him by reputation from all the single missionary ladies uh, many years all ago. All the ladies? Well, all the all single ladies? Every, every single one. I'm excited to invite back to the show a, a guest that's been here before, Dr. Nathan Sloan, who is a pastor of, uh, he was a missionary with ABWE, actually serving in South Asia. Uh, I've been a pastor of Sojourn Church in Midtown, working with missions particularly. Uh, he's an adjunct professor at Southern Seminary and does a lot of teaching and writing on missions. And currently he's in a new role or a relatively new role as executive director for up, I almost said uptown sending, but it's not, it's upstream <laughs> sending. And, uh, and Nathan, and welcome to the show. Glad to have you back. And uh, tell us a little bit what's going on in your life. Yeah, thanks for having me. Uh, to give context for all the single ladies, before I get in trouble with my wife, when I was a single guy being on the field, <laughs> there's not a lot of us. So uh, being a single Good guy. Good job was, on you for inserting that context. Yeah, I, Good. being a single guy on the field was a commodity. So anyway. She had to know that. She had to have known that. She, did. she was actually one of those single ladies. So it all worked out. The perfect. That's great. That's right. Yeah. Thanks for having me, guys. It's been it's been a joy. Uh, I had an opportunity to be on this show before to, to talk to you. But yeah, in the last uh, 18 months, kind of shifted away from my full time pastor role into starting this new sending organization. Uh, so it's been a lot of fun to, to do the startup. I've, I've read about startups. I listen to podcasts and startups, but to, to actually jump into one has been a big learning curve. So as a missionary, a pastor, and a missions leader, what are some of the big issues that are burdening you that you're going after in the missions world right now that you think need correction? Yeah, well, I think there are a lot of things we should always be talking about. I think there are plenty of days where I'm tired of going after issues that can get really weary. A few of the, the things that really drive my soul that you know keep me up, up at night or I talk to my other friends about are... I mean, one was really the genesis of upstream sending, this concept of the centrality of the local church in global sending. 
And as we've started this organization, Posture Toward the Church, one of the big lessons that I've seen applied is I've traveled this fall, sitting with global leaders around the world, different nationalities, different ethnicities, is really the need for this centrality of the local church in receiving and in field partnership. So Mm -hmm. those are the two driving things right now in my life when it comes to missiology, the centrality of the church in both sending and receiving and then the the rise and prominence of the global South in missions, which I realize lots of people are talking mm-hmm. about that. But as a, a local church pastor, as a, a Westerner who's been involved in Western sending, I have so much to learn about the global South. So I've just been posturing myself, reading books, sitting with friends. That's the best places that I've learned about the movement of the global South and global missions, the growth of the church is actually to sit and have tea with people overseas and ask questions and to hear stories. So those would be the two driving things probably right now when I think about missiology. Probably mm-hmm. most of our listeners know what you mean when you say Global South, but can you unpack that just a little bit for those who maybe don't know? Yeah, there's other ways to think about it uh, the majority world, but I, we choose to use the Global South. Basically, it's the, the parts of the world that would be uh, South America, Latin America, Africa, Asia, these non-Western parts of the world. Um, Typically, they have been Mm -hmm. looked down upon a little bit socioeconomically. And then even in the Christian world, right? Theologically, we we think of them as places of of large gospel need. But when we actually pull back the curtain, there's things that God is doing that maybe we don't read about a lot in books or we don't see a lot on the news, but God's church is doing. It's just incredible things. Um, Mm -hmm. So it's those, those places around the world. That's great. I, I want to get a little bit of, at your, your focus on the local church, because that's your heart. That's our heart on this show as well. As someone I was talking to recently said, well, you've got a lot of highbrow theology on the missions podcast. I don't know if that's true. Well, thank you, you as the listeners. Yeah, sure. I, I don't know if that's a compliment or not. Um, hopefully not highbrow, but definitely theology. But the point is, there's a lot of these top shelf missiological issues that we could talk about. Some of the things that you mentioned there and and even defining our terms, those aren't things that everyone in the pews is necessarily thinking about. But, you know, Nathan, I was just uh, submitting our missions report for our congregation to our elder board, uh, getting ready to present what the missions committee did this past year to our church. We've got a small church. We've got a modest missions program. And looking at that, realizing by God's grace, we've been able to accomplish some incredible things. And I've seen incredible generosity through our church as well. At the same time, for us to be at the point where we're sending our own missionaries, where we're seeing just this organic pipeline of people with a heart for the nations just spilling out and, and we're sending them all over the, the world and they're multiplying themselves and they're mobilizing others within the church. It would be a work of God to get us to that point, right? That's simply not where we're at yet. And when I look at the landscape of the church, I see some of the top shelf missiological stuff being discussed. I don't see as much of just the basic discussions of why do we go to the lost? Why missions? Why is this important? Things that I think maybe I'm guilty of taking for granted sometimes, but I think we need to be reminded of. What do you think? Yeah, I think that is that will always be an issue we need to focus in on. You could even say it's a discipleship issue. We, we need to disciple our people. And part of that discipleship is understanding their sentness, understanding that the gospel is a privilege we've been given. It's something we experience ourselves, right? When I teach at Southern Seminary, I teach this like adjunct class, I always use this idea of uh, the difference between a, a reservoir and a river. You know, here in Louisville, we have this beautiful reservoir. It's historic. You can walk around it and they, they keep water there in case they need it. It's like backup water. And sometimes that's how we act the way the gospel is. We want it, We want to keep it to ourselves. But, but really what the gospel is, it's a river. It is moving and it's changing. It's it's changing landscapes. And the call is for us to actually dive in and to embrace it. So in the, in the local church, we fail our people if we're not giving them a picture of how the gospel both impacts them and sends them out on mission, mm-hmm. and that extends globally. So I give all of that context to say, yes, I'm with you. And I think, like sitting in the chair I do, or I'm often rubbing shoulders with churches who do have probably more missions dollars than your church, has more sent ones, has more people in the pews. But the principles I see those churches applying— are applicable to a church of any size. So it's not just the big churches or the sending agencies or the seminaries who have a stranglehold on missions. I think that small churches do themselves a disservice when they don't think that they have a significant role to play because they do a very significant role. Mm. 
yeah, I was in a church, you know, my first church in pastoral ministry, uh, probably a church of, you know, fluctuated between 100 and 200 for about 100 years. But, you know, they had sent out, I mean, the time when I was there, I was at, actually at one point sent out by them, probably had five or six missionaries on the field sent by that church. And their annual budget was well over $100,000 mm. in annual giving to foreign missions. So mm. I know small churches can have a big impact and we want to see big and small churches have an impact. So that's part of the reason I think you wrote this book. You got a new book out called You Are Sent. So what is your hope with this book and how does the structure of the book organize in a way to help accomplish that purpose? I wrote the book in our local church's context. We were, we had a vision to raise up and send out people. And Alex, it was a miracle of God when that first person was called as one of our founding elders, and he decided he wanted to go to Ethiopia with his family. And it created a culture and a movement that continued to spread. We had other families who wanted to go, but then we had a problem. It's how do we develop them? Because we weren't just going to hand that off to a seminary. We're just going to hand that off to ABWE or another organization. We had a responsibility. So we pieced together books and resources. And uh, by the way, Chris Howell's podcast that you, you know, that you did with him. That was amazing. It was really helpful. Um, but we were taking books like that, that he suggested, walking people through it, having them write papers and, you know, all the, just, we we're doing the best that we could. But as I started to talk to other mission pastors, I realized they were having the same problem. And we just, I just, we needed a resource that wasn't overly simplistic, but it wasn't too academically robust. We need something that's really built for the church. Mm. So that we could prepare our people well, take them from the pew to, to good preparation. Now, again, no resource is really going to develop you fully, but we need it. Right. We need a missing piece of the puzzle. So we created it for our local church's context. But then what I did is I actually interviewed about 15 mission pastors around the country about what the things they're looking for in a resource, the issues they're facing. And I tried to bring kind of all those needs together in what this resource became. Well, speaking of missing puzzle pieces, something that doesn't often come up and arguably it should in this whole conversation is God's wrath, his justice, his holiness as a motivator. You know, we want to talk about God's glory. We want to talk about the joy of participating in the mission, but you really go right in for the kill there in chapter three, I believe it is. So tell us why. You know, it's interesting. I think that that chapter developed organically. I started building out what our people needed to understand. So I start with biblical basis of mission, right? And I knew I wanted to get to missions history. That's kind of the thing I love to talk about. But I wanted to give a theology of mission. But I couldn't cover every issue possible. And it's like, what, what's the core issue we're talking about? Again, I'm thinking about our cultural context. I'm thinking about the kind of um, millennials and Gen Z people who are coming up in our church. And one of the things that comes up over and over again is the reality of lostness. What happens to someone who dies and who doesn't know Jesus? And kind of the old school idea of someone going to hell, the wrath of God, it just felt so distant than the worldview of the people we were training. But it, it's the truth. It's what the Bible articulates is that Jesus came to save people from lostness, from their brokenness, to rescue them. As I was studying, it's just, I think this is the crux issue in theology that we need to hit in this book, is missions is only necessary if lostness is real. If mm. God is pouring out his wrath against sin and his son came to appease that and to rescue us from hell. So kind of going into to, to God's wrath against sin and then giving a vision uh, of what that that looks like, the realities of that missions, actually conclude that chapter uh, with a case study about, and you guys have, I'm sure, seen this multiple places, but the this idea of if someone was born on an island that had no contact with the outside world, no right. full, you know, message, and they had cr creation and they tried their best to follow, if they never heard the word of Jesus, what would happen to them when they die? And then we put them in case studies. And it's fascinating to see how people handle this because their heart has all this empathy. It's like, could God really send someone to hell? And what we try to help, what I've tried to help them understand is like, we are all already lost. We are all already damned. And what the gospel does is it rescues us out of that reality. 
Mm. So, yeah, it, it really is this discipleship moment in that chapter to mm. take people from relativism, pluralism, inclusivism into this full understanding of what we call exclusivism, that Jesus is the only way mm. to save. That's great. I, I want to shift gears just a, obviously a, a little bit here. You talk about living scent, and I would love for you to just talk about that a little bit. Do you see living scent, and maybe you can describe what you mean by that in the book, as different from being uniquely sent out as a missionary? Do you see those as two different things? Uh, I'd love to hear you know, your how you unpack that. Yeah, I would say there are two different things conceptually, but they're wedded together. I think we have done ourselves a disservice in the church when we separate these two ideas of making Jesus known and international missions. Now, I'm getting into tricky water here, I realize. But what I'm trying to say is I think there is a distinction. But what we naturally do is we as broken people want to find excuses for us not to live on mission. So we elevate mm-hmm. the missionary and that gives us a reason not to live on mission. But then we overcompensate, right? Everybody's a missionary and then cross-cultural link, learning linguistics, all those things get downplayed. So I think the way we at a, a upstream collective and then at sojourn and then now at upstream sending, I think the way we have thought about this is this idea of our identity being found in Jesus as sent ones, mm. meaning mm. the triune God from before the creation of the world had a plan to send Jesus into the world. He was sent from the Trinity to embody humanity, to live a perfect life, to die on the cross for us to to raise from the dead. He came with a mission. He's this model of what a missionary is. And what I mean by that is like the embodiment, he enculturated and all of these things, right? It's just this beautiful, he was sent with purpose. And then Mm. he comes, he leaves earth, goes to heaven. He even says the Holy Spirit can't come until I leave. So the, mm. the, the spirit is being yeah. sent by the father and the son. There's a sending movement. And then that triune God, the father, son, the Holy Spirit, send the church out on mission and by the church sending us as individuals. So it's my belief that the sending or evangelism or missions, uh, depending on the context, it's more than an activity. It's, it's our identity. And when we participate in those things, we're living out the identity we've been given. And I don't know if mm. you've experienced this. But for me, evangelism is really difficult. I Hmm. struggle to do it. It's really hard. It's scary. I'm afraid of what people think of failure, all those things, right? They're internal. Yet when I step out and I declare the gospel, even if I'm shut down, there's a joy that wells up inside. Yeah. Why is that? Because I'm living out my identity as a sent one. Mm. Always. That's the theme woven through the book is that identity. That's incredibly encouraging. It convicts me too, but that ties back in, Nathan, with what you're saying uh, from the beginning about the the living water, the gospel, the life that we're participating in from God. Uh, we're not just sitting in this tributary. We're not just in a lake. We're in a, a river. I think of the imagery from Isaiah's, or, or not Isaiah, Ezekiel's temple, where it's it's a trickle of water from under the altar that turns into this mighty rushing w- river, this this beautiful picture of the living water of the new covenant made available for all of the nations. And it's it's really powerful when you step into that, but then it's also pretty clear when you step out of that and you're not feeling that same motion in your own life. And so kind of on that note, speaking about the lay person, speaking to the individual, you and I both know most people aren't going to go as cross-cultural missionaries. Just in the providence of God, most people tend to stay in the place, you know, in the, in the state in which they were called, right, to use Paul's terminology. And so why would you say it's important then for everyone to be familiar with these concepts, to be familiar with other cultures, especially with, with learning uh, and appreciating other cultures, other nations, even other languages, when someone's not necessarily going to be crossing borders? Yeah, because I, I think God cares about the nations and we should care about those things, too. So not everyone is going to cross borders and learn a different language and cross cultures in that kind of extreme sense. But everyone should care about the nations and should play an active role in global missions. So I think it's just a really significant point that we as believers, it's part of our discipleship process. We all need to care about that. And some of our our world realities demand that. No longer can someone not cross cultures. Because the truth is, if you live in any kind of urban setting or even suburban setting, 
you're going to cross cultures constantly, right? You go to the coffee shop. And so I go to the coffee shop here. It, it's in a kind of gritty part of town. There is a way that I'm supposed to order. There's a way that I'm supposed to talk. There's a place I'm supposed to sit. There's etiquette mm. there. Mm-hmm. I go to my community that's primarily African-American. There's a way, there's a culture that they engage in that I have to learn and adapt to. There are refugees and international students all around me. So I'm always learning how to cross cultures. So understanding culture is valuable. And then the the call to every believer is to care about the movement of nations be across the street across the world, we, we play a part in that process. So yeah, not everyone's called to be a cross-cultural missionary, but to um, not care is to not be faithful to the gospel. Yeah. I think of my own story, you know, I, I grew up in rural Wisconsin. I mean, I, we had one non-Caucasian person in our whole school, and that was someone who was adopted. And then growing to a school that had a larger Hispanic community and learning a little bit more about about them. And, but then it was really, it wasn't until I worked in an inner city setting and was around different cultures and realized the stark differences about the way they viewed so many different things that really caused me to think about that. Mm-hmm. And then it, it created a, a yearning in my heart to know and love different people, which I think fed my love for mission. So I can see why that's so important for people. Even if you're in a setting like rural Wisconsin in which everyone you know comes from a Norwegian background or a German background to understand the world we live in and how God uses that love and appreciation of differences to build a heartbeat for people that God may use to call, if not you, maybe one of your kids or someone else from your church. So I appreciate mm-hmm. that that emphasis. What, what comes to mind with some of this then is, okay, let's say you're living this lifestyle Let's say you're you're sensitive to the leading of the spirit. You're stepping out in faith. You're having gospel conversations. You care about other cultures. You care about your neighbors. I mean, I, one question that I have then is, what's that next push in your life that that's going to move you to being sent out uh, in a more official capacity from the church? Because that that is your goal at Upstream. That's your goal with the book is to see people sent out in that way. Yeah, it's totally the goal. I mean, seventy five percent of this book is global missions, unapologetically but trying to get people to see that their first call is to obedience today. The best missionaries are the ones who, who just live the life that you picture, right? They wake up wherever they plant their feet. They want to live on mission. And that means opening their home, opening their lives, being vulnerable themselves, being planted and rooted in a community. There's all these things. And as you guys who have been believers a long time are leaders in your church, we're looking for that in our church members, right? the ones who are faithful to what they've been given. Yeah. And those are the people, again, the best missionary sending is the movement of discipleship on someone's life. They come to faith, they're following Jesus, the sanctification is happening. We give them leadership, they take on more leadership. And at some point, a, a, a church leader in our life or someone is inviting them to greater obedience. So that's what I'd say. If, if that person you're talking about is rooted in a local church, hopefully a leader is going to, give them a vision for something bigger than themselves. I think the way we've all seen it play out is God uses that daily faithfulness. And then he opens a door you don't expect. Hey, could you go on this short term trip or would you tutor this refugee family? And then all of a sudden you met a Somali and you learned about Islam and you're, you start going down this path and your heart develops for those things. So That's where my theology of sovereignty comes in, in that as I'm walking and journeying with people who want to go overseas, I'm not overly concerned about what the next step is, because if they're being obedient and we're trying to give them wisdom about the future, Jesus will show up. The Lord will show up in their life. He will make the way clear. So we don't have to worry about all those little steps throughout the process. I love that. You, we we get this idea of, Hey, a young person goes to cross con and uh, gets you know, fired up for doing great things for God. And then the next step is to sign up with ABWE or, or upstream sending. And and instead we're saying, if God's stirring you, go back home and volunteer to teach kids Sunday school class, Uh, get involved in your church's refugee ministry, get involved in just serving in ordinary, normal ways and letting God continue to grow you through that. I love that. It's such a natural and normal progression that we just want to jump to the exciting parts, which you're going to fail spectacularly if you don't go through those, those right steps of discipleship. And the trick is like, how do we not lose momentum with those people? How do we keep them excited and passionate about missions? 
but the people who go overseas who uh, actually thrive and make an impact are the people who have lived that life here. So we have an opportunity. The best place for assessment and development is in the context of the local church. So we don't have to worry about call. I, I did this so many times in pastoral ministry. You love missions. I get it. You want to like change the world for Jesus. I'm about it. We want to continue to stoke that. But let's show up for church on Sunday. Let's mm-hmm. step into a ministry <laughs> we have. Let's share the gospel with that coworker. I, I don't know if I can just do that. I'm too busy. It's like, if you're too busy to do that, we're not going to send you to the nations. <laughs> Take step one yeah. and then we'll help you process step two and three. Yeah, that's great. It's simply doing the next thing. I mean, here we are at the beginning of a new year. Maybe you have resolutions. I I was reading some things, some articles, getting ready, some content for ABWE today, and I'm convicted looking at my life and seeing my woeful inadequacy in terms of personal evangelism. And you're mm-hmm. absolutely right. We can't we can't just jump to these these great and spectacular things. What's been some of the reception of the book so far? I think it's been good. I mean, you know, uh, whenever you put yourself out there, you don't really know what's going to happen. But, you know, I wrote this for the church. So primarily the people who are picking it up are church leaders or mission agencies, people like that. I've had a few friends who who will buy the book and they'll sit down and try to just read it like a novel. And I'll get a text message. Hey, this book's really confusing. I was like, well, it, it, you don't read it like that. It's a study that you do in a community with other people. So Lots of it, it doesn't actually work by yourself. It's supposed to be done in community. So it, the, the, the experience so far, the, the feedback I've gotten is good. I think it's um, specifically for the churches who are looking for this. It seems to be useful. Yeah. So just for those who aren't familiar with the structure, I mean, each chapter starts with an article uh, that you read and kind of gets your heart prepared for it. And it leads into discussion and work things that you can work through as a group. So if you're a small, you know, a pastor with small groups and you want to encourage them in this or a Sunday school class or, or uh, something like that, that is really the right setting for this. Do you see this being used in international contexts as well? Or is this particularly for a North American context? Yeah, I was really thankful for my editor. Um, New Growth gave me an editor and one of his uh, pushbacks along the way is like, hey, this is a, a uniquely American illustration. Let's change it up where mm. if we want to translate this into a different language for the global church, we could. So, I mean, I can't not be in my own culture, sure. but my hope is that it could be really helpful. So um, there's an international church in Madrid who's going through it right now. So when I got that email, it was, it was really encouraging. I'll, I'll add one more thing, Scott, just to the, the structure, which I think has been yeah. helpful to clarify that the first half of the book is what a student would go through. So there's the article, there's the, the the application part, there's questions, there's renewal things that go to the heart. And then the last half of the book is actually for the leader and it's my teaching manuscripts. And the way I did it this way is so that a, a small church or maybe a leader who doesn't have cross-cultural experience could simply just teach through the manuscript if they wanted to. Or if you're a, a, a seasoned person or have lots of experience, you could throw away all of it or cut and paste and put your own mm. stories in. But I wanted to give everything that I teach so that someone could feel comfortable to teach the material. Mm. So helpful. What are some of the other things you're working on? I know upstream collective is something that Alex and I are always uh, enjoying articles and things. What else are you working on and how can people get in touch with you and learn more about your ministry? A couple things that we're working on. It's the the missions vision of upstream sending, um, and the the what we're landing on is we're going to have the whole like vision of how we do ministry at sending will be modeled in two networks, because our core value is relationship, relationship with our sending pastors, and relationship with our field workers. So our I'm, we're building that out. the The first network is our sending network. That's the community of churches and church leaders we work with. We're empowering them. We're facilitating where they're learning from one another. And the other is our field network. These are the the people and places we send missionaries to. And these are about half of them are global leaders. They're Indians and Kenyans and Chinese. And the other half are are Western workers with our agencies and with other agencies. And we like pull them together in a leaders network, but they're also receiving missionaries from upstream. So again, I spend a lot of my time explaining what we're doing because it's a kind of a different model. So right. building the the framework of that, and then as far as like writing and missiology, myself and a few other upstream collective guys are putting out a book this year called The Sending Church Applied. 
we have these 17 elements we call the sending church elements that we use to coach leaders. And we're actually shrink those down to like nine. That'd be helpful. <laughs> no, I'm laughing. I'm, for those of you listening, I'm, I'm, that was a joke. I'm, uh, it sounded dry, but no. <laughs> uh, you can think of it as four phases. And if you don't want to think about 17 elements, but we're writing a chapter on each of those elements so that, you know, we have a book called sending church to find. So what, 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 do, what do we talk about when we talk about ascending church? And this is applied. How do you actually do this in the context of the church? So that'll, I don't know when it'll come out. It'll come out at some point this year. Mm. Well, one of the things you've done that's helpful here, Nathan, today is you've helped us connect some of the dots. Because I remember last time we had you on the show and we talked in April at T4G, we talked about upstream sending and we talked about being kind of a boutique mission sending force that's really focused on the churches that are that are doing this seriously and have a full built out pipeline. And not every church is there. And what this is really doing is taking some of those cookies, putting them on the bottom shelf mm. so that churches and lay people that don't yet understand all that's involved in some of the the top shelf things can still get their foot in the water and can step into really the sending heart of God. Mm. And so thankful that you've put together a resource along those lines. So real quick, before we wind up, uh, before we wrap up, where can people get the book? Yeah, you get it. Uh, New Growth Press, our publisher has a website. Um, they often give bulk discounts. And that the reason that's helpful is a lot of people will buy them to do a Bible yeah. study or, or class. Uh, and then you just buy it on Amazon. It's, you know, there's a paper copy and then you can get it on Kindle as well. Yeah. Very good. Nathan Sloan, executive director, Upstream Sending. Thank you so much for joining us. And thank you for joining us for listening to the show. As we mentioned earlier, you can partner with us at missionspodcast.com slash support. And you can share the show with a friend as well as leaving a positive rating and review. That'll get this content in front of others that can be blessed by it. Well, as always, the Missions Podcast is a ministry of ABWE. To learn more about ABWE, go to abwe.org. And if you have a question or a suggestion for a future episode, maybe someone we should interview, you can email alex at missionspodcast.com or Scott. Scott's available too, scott at missionspodcast.com. Well, thank you for being here, and we'll see you next week on the Missions Podcast.